Our final talk for the first half of this session is from David, Dr. David Clooney, who is, comes to us from PixelMed. He's a radiologist, medical informaticist, DICOM open source software author, and the editor and an editor of the DICOM standard. He was formerly the co-chair of the IHE Radiological Technical Committee and industry co-chairman of the DICOM Standards Committee, as well as being a chairman of several of the working groups. And today he'll be talking to us about DICOM, the testament of time. And David, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation to speak. So uh, this is sort of a combination of what DICOM is, the history of DICOM, and what DICOM may or may not be in the future. So uh, conflict of interest, I am the editor of the DICOM standard. I get paid to do that. So naturally, uh, every problem is solved with DICOM, uh, in my opinion, which introduces uh, an element of bias. And I also have various academic and commercial consulting contracts as a subject matter expert in the field. So if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from this uh, session, it's the fact that there's more to DICOM than just being a file format. I know a lot of researchers tend to view DICOM as just yet another irritating file format to deal with, but there's a lot more to it than, than being a format. First of all, of course, it's an open standard, and this is a uh, meeting that's about open standards uh, and open science. And it's primarily a specification for interoperability, and we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but as I say, more than a file format, it's also a protocol for messaging and transport. It specifies various services, metadata encoding, information objects, and an information model, uh, encoding of the pixel data, uh, as well as, to some extent, application functionality specification and a conformance mechanism for uh, assuring uh, conformance uh, to that specification. And from an AI and quantitative imaging perspective, very importantly, it also provides annotation, rendering, and reporting uh, me mechanisms uh, in a standard form. So as has been made clear by the earlier speakers, open science needs open standards, and DICOM is open from a number of different perspectives. There are many alternative definitions of what an open standard needs to be, but uh, we try to make a DICOM free to the extent possible, uh, freely accessible, freely usable, uh, freely extensible, and free to participate in uh, with respect to extending it. And we also are keen to have as many uh, different platforms and languages supported in freely available reference libraries and utilities, uh, many of which I'm sure you're uh, very familiar with. Interoperability definitions vary too, but um, perhaps the most important aspect of interoperability is not only can you We seem to have lost audio from Dr. Clooney. Let me see if I can get Laura on here. Hey, Eric, I'm here. Yeah, we seem <clears throat> hey, yeah. Hey, David, do you still hear us? If you could send a chat. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can yes. hear you. There we go. Cool. Can you Wait, hear me you're... again? Yes, we lost you uh, at the start of this slide. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, you know, in, in the mid 90s, before PACs became ubiquitous, um, people talked about these uh, mini clusters or clusters of PACs that had modalities and workstations, maybe an archive and, and maybe a printer back in the days when we used to print things. And so, DICOM was initially developed to support this kind of uh, uh, departmental solution. But it also addressed the question of moving things around on interchange media, and I dare say many of you recall magneto-optical disks, and, and sadly we still use CDs today to transport uh, MR images around. Um, so wh why is DICOM the way it is? Who was and, and remains the customer? Uh, and largely it's the turnkey clinical device purchaser, uh, the sort of person who supplies uh, clinical people um, with clinical solutions. And they are the ones that decide what goes into uh, medical imaging device products, including interoperability features. And this all started in the mid to late 80s, and there were consequences of, of that historical time period. As I say, who's supported by the standard researchers, trialists, engineers are to some extent considered, but ultimately it's the clinical radiologist, plus or minus the referring physician, who's the primary focus of DICOM, which turns out to be very frustrating uh, to researchers. 
different users have different requirements, but Docom is focused very much on the high throughput plug and play patient oriented uh, uh, use case as opposed to the more technically sophisticated um, you know, raw data user, for example. Um, and at the same time, we have to also allow for innovation and extensibility, um, which frequently leads, at least transiently, to reduced interoperability until innovative uh, features become standardized. And it's the product engineering managers who allocate the resources uh, that define what gets put into a product. And so to reiterate, the focus is almost exclusively clinical, although increasingly uh, researchers are being taken into account, particularly with the artificial intelligence uh, craze. So there are a lot of consequences of uh, having grown up in the 80s, including shoulder pads and big hair and various other things, um, some of which are good and some of which are bad. Uh, but it, at the time Devard Dockham was developed, we were all reading off film and had huge film libraries and image uh, processing and display in computers was extraordinarily primitive by comparison with what we have today. Uh, and indeed, the first PAX was conceived back in 1973 by Mayer Ebrecht, and um, it was a remarkably uh, uh, foresightful paper uh, that described uh, pretty much uh, what we do today, uh, but wasn't technologically infeasible at the time. As I say, magneto-optical disks were the state of the art when I grew up as a uh, neuroradiologist, and um, uh, sadly, we haven't really gotten away from media. Uh, magnetic tape formats um, with proprietary files uh, were where we started, and it was these formats that defined essentially what needed to go into DICOM. And so when the first PAX conferences were held in the early 80s, standards were being considered, and this is almost 40 years ago. And at the time, the FDA and the ACR and NEMA, representing the vendors, got together. And in 1985, they produced their first standard, which, which really is DICOM. It just wasn't called DICOM at the time. And in 1993, some uh, you know, eight years later or so, what we now consider DICOM, DICOM 3, was finally issued. And to put this into perspective, this is the era in which Ethernet was being defined, TIFF was being defined, GIF was being defined, uh, JPEG was defined just before uh, DICOM was issued, which is good because we managed to include JPEG in the standard. And so this gives you a perhaps a perspective on the kind of technology we had to work with. Originally, there was a 50-pin, 16-channel uh, uh, interface, um, and all of the electronics associated with it were, were specified in the standard. Of course, nobody does that now, and it wasn't until a bit later that Ethernet became ubiquitous, and everything, of course, is done over Ethernet now. But this is the messaging from the original 1985 standard in an example, and we still use, at least from the data set perspective, uh, the same tag value pairs. Uh, everything is in binary. Um, strings are encoded in ASCII or, or various different uh, character sets. Uh, and it is um, this kind of similar to TIFF uh, tag value pair based specification uh, that persists to this day. So how does DICOM differ as a file format from, from other file formats? Um, data sets are embedded in file wrappers. Uh, and these are the same data sets that are transferred over the protocols that are used within PACS. And they include a modality and acquisition and clinical information module, model uh, that uh, is very different from, say, a TIFF file or a JPEG file, which have no information about the patient's name or patient identity or anything like that. Um, and this metadata is used both to identify and describe the entities. And this metadata is embedded in each and every file. So when you take a DICOM file out of hospital A and take it to hospital B, patient's name is still there. The fact that it's a T1-weighted acquisition is still there. The fact that it was done on a GE scanner is still there. And every data set is given a unique identifier, a global unique identifier, as are all of the higher level entities uh, up to the patient level. And these allow grouping of multiple images into series and studies and so on. Again, very different from any consumer image format. And quite different from any of the research imaging formats that you're probably very familiar with. This is the kind of information on model that we use. Um, and in producing this model, DICOM inherited a lot from the legacy formats. The objective was to reduce the barrier to entry for the engineers from the scanner vendors uh, of the day. Uh, and so GE uh, Genesis and the Siemens and Philips standard product interconnect, which was based on the first ACR NEMA format, um, were the major sources of information for the MR and CT formats. And um, 
nowadays it seems rather quaint, uh, but we have one instance or file per reconstructed slice. And those of you who use Nifty probably find this the most irritating feature of DICOM. Uh, but that was the way the scanners were made back in the day. And their array processors spat out one slice reconstructed quite slowly uh, at a time, and each was then encoded into a proprietary file and then sent to a DICOM file. It has a binary uh, a tag value pair stream, as I described, compared to many of the proprietary formats, which had a fixed layout. And the header is embedded with the pixel data, uh, just as it was in most of the proprietary formats. The other thing uh, that is um, consistent with the old proprietary formats is that the a patient study acquisition series and instance information, which was available in the proprietary formats, is replicated into DICOM, sometimes into standard attributes and sometimes into proprietary attributes if they're too machine specific. Uh, and these were generally information that's available either from the operator or from the pulse sequence and its parameters. And in general, all of these formats predated the concept of volume acquisitions. Um, you know, there were 3D pulse sequences beginning to be used at the time, uh, but by and large, everything was, was uh, reconstructed as a single slice. Uh, and there weren't very many use cases for 3D in general clinical practice. Uh, and uh, this long predated, for example, even magnetic resonance angiography. So in trying to do better, we introduced the so-called enhanced MR family of objects in about 2002. And at that time, uh, we tried to solve a whole bunch of problems. Multiple slices in one data set, factoring out the commonality per slice, more mandatory, consistent acquisition-related attributes and codes, more precise definition of timing, explicit specification of uh, dimensions, separation of quantitation from the rendering pipeline, and it was a total failure because we were trying to solve a problem that had already largely been solved. And very few of the vendors, only one vendor, decided uh, to pick it up. But it has become the basis of, of all new IODs, including segmentations and parametric maps. And so we took single slices and turned them into you know, one monster file and sent that one all at once. We factored out the commonality. We introduced dimensions. We introduced more precise timing. We separated the rendering pipeline from the real world value mapping into units like velocity or B value or whatever. Uh, we also added spectroscopy capabilities um, as well as uh, support for met, uh, metabolite maps. Um, and we even considered uh, MR raw data. And I, in preparing for this talk, I dug out some old emails from uh, early in the 90s and um, uh, I actually had suggested that we include raw data in the original DICOM standard. Of course, there was no uptake of this. There was no uptake of it uh, subsequently. And then uh, when we did uh, raw data in 2002, we just said, okay, you can have patient study series equipment information, but we're not going to have a standard payload. And this is just a means to essentially store and regurgitate raw data that is in vendor-specific proprietary attributes. So it's nowhere near as useful as the ISMRM raw data uh, standard, uh, which is great, except that it's not DICOM. So if there's one thing I hate about MRD, it's that it's not DICOM based, although it could obviously easily be translated into DICOM if we wanted to. By contrast, uh, physicists who've been working on the CT projection data uh, extension to DICOM, uh, which they have developed outside the DICOM standard, have uh, used DICOM as the basis for that raw data. So what about the move into the artificial intelligence and quantitative imaging world? Well, historically most, well not most, but many MR applications have been quantitative, uh, but the quantitative results have rarely been persisted in DICOM in a standard form, and screenshots are about the best we've been able to extract uh, for, for the users. And this, of course, is useless semantically because it's not machine readable, it's not reusable, even though a human can understand it when they look at it. The surge of renewed interest in AI is a completely new market force that is changing people's perspective and greatly increasing the likelihood that annotations of various forms and derived data of various forms will need to be uh, recorded and persisted in DICOM uh, format. And so we've been extending the standard over the years to add various different uh, formats specific to different kinds of parametric imaging, heat maps, annotations of various different kinds at the raster level and the contour level. So there's a bunch of different ways uh, to use, uh, to encode, for example, ROIs, like we discussed in the previous talk. Um, and we believe that structured reports and segmentations 
are the best way to do that nowadays, uh, with the exception of RT structure sets, which obviously have a uh, high uptake in the RT community and are extremely important in their own right. We also have real-world value maps, which can be used uh, with the enhanced MR objects or separately. Parametric maps, which are particularly useful for heat maps that you might want to superimpose on a structural image. Uh, and we have the second generation radiotherapy annotations, which actually have what they refer to as conceptual volumes, which is a grammar for combining contours and segmentations. Fiducials, uh, registration rigid and deformable, can all be encoded in DICOM. Tractography can be encoded in DICOM. So essentially, the DICOM standard has remained the same, but gradually been extended over time in order to evolve to support uh, new technology. So our primary focus in extension, extending DICOM is to have new and updated information object definitions and attributes for new technology. You know, arterial spin labeling comes along, so we add the necessary features to support that. But it still remains um, what uh, one person's paper I was reading this morning called woefully archaic uh, in terms of its design. And this drives modern developers crazy, but it is uh, the price you pay for stability in the industry and, and backward compatibility and essentially plug and pay, play over a period of, of decades. So DACOM is very reluctant to leap on the latest um, IT bandwagon, if you like, uh, and prefers to do things the way we've always done them. Although we do add new protocols, particularly the DACOM web stuff, which is HTTP RESTful, new representations, both in XML and JSON for the metadata, new compression schemes, which add value uh, in both still frame and video applications, New types for bulk data, particularly floating point pixels, which we've added for parametric maps. Uh, new object types, such as parametric maps and tractography. And recently, we've added EEG and various other neurophysiology formats to support particularly sleepy uh, uh, video e and EEG. And new security mechanisms, which are obviously extremely important. Um, if uh, the log4j disaster over the weekend uh, uh, gives you any inkling. But what we don't generally do is have a revolution in DICOM. So, you know, you won't hear us talk very often about DICOM 4. Sometimes we fantasize about it, but rarely do we consider it seriously. Um, so the future direction of DICOM could be either to be extended indefinitely, incrementally, as we have done historically. And as I hope I've made clear, backward compatibility has long been our number one priority. Or DICOM could be completely reconceived, perhaps with new information model, new protocols, new API, new representations. Um, but again, just like the failure of the multi-frame enhanced uh, MR object, does being completely different but solving the same problem actually add any value? Uh, and so are there any new problems that actually require a new standard architecture? One potential problem is the need to do high-speed parallel reading and writing of bulk data, bulk pixel data uh, in a cloud environment. And so we have been looking at things like the n 5 czar style fragmentation of bulk data and separation from the metadata, which uh, helps facilitate that sort of thing. But to some extent, our old-fashioned single-slice approach um, makes that fairly straightforward anyway. So uh, in conclusion, I'd just like to uh, give credit to the early pioneers of DICOM, who, uh, uh, some of whom are now long dead uh, or retired from the industry. But um, uh, even though DICOM may be a woefully archaic format, I think there is still some utility in it yet. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much for the informative talk and retrospective there on the DICOM format, Dr. Clooney. Um, again, anyone on the call, if you have questions, please type them into the chat window and, and I'll relay those. Um, I guess I'd start off with the DICOM standard was successful in getting uh, adopted by the major vendors and pulling them away from having their individual file formats um, from having gone through that, do you have any suggestions for how uh, the ISMRM RD or the MRD format might market itself to uh, vendors to get the same sort of adoption? Well, I think the most important thing is is to be collaborative and to get involved. Uh, working Group 16, uh, which is the DACOM MR working group, is variously uh, active depending on whether they're working on something. At the moment. I think currently they're working on fMRI um, uh, protocols. But if you get at least one vendor engineer or product manager interested, um, or if you get uh, one very vocal um, 
uh, academic interested in participating, uh, then you can achieve almost anything in DICOM. It's largely a question of having people there to do the work, uh, to write the standard. But of course, there's no point in writing the standard unless people are willing to adopt it. So, so making a business case for incorporation of raw data export in the standard format from a vendor's product um, uh, may be challenging, um, but it is, uh, it is certainly possible. We had one uh, more editorial comment, looks like, in the chat, uh, which I just... Yeah, Raj think. writes that uh, private fields are evil, and, and he's right, <laughs> private fields are evil. And um, the difficulty is that um, without private fields, you can't incorporate innovation. Um, so as you add new pulse sequences, um, you need to be able to record their parameters so that your own applications can take advantage of them. Uh, but then uh, once it becomes standardized across the industry, um, the vendors who've already written the software to use those private fields aren't motivated to re-implement using the standard field. So, you know, diffusion b-value is a case in point. It was a long time before the ma major vendors' products uh, all started using the standard field for b-value as opposed to their private fields. Uh, and that that is a, it's, there's really no solution to that, um, except the customer demanding change. Well, I, I saw in one of your slides that there's some enhanced uh, capability for XML or JSON metadata. Is that just encapsulated uh, or does that uh, really supplement the tag value layout? Uh, it's used in the DICOM web uh, standard mostly. So when you uh, transfer or uh, query for a standard DICOM image, you are do using a kind of old fashioned binary protocol developed in the 90s. Um, if you use the DICOM web interface, you're using HTTP calls. You can type them by hand if you want into the into curl or some or the URL of the browser, and um, get a response. And that response can be specified to be in JSON or XML. And that's a translation of the DICOM name value pairs into a, a standard XML schema or a standard JSON uh, pattern. And you can also create images and store them that way. You can create a JSON metadata header and a separate bulk data payload and submit those to, and the server will combine them together and make a, a, a traditional DICOM part 10 file on the server. All right. 